Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the webinar, Tele-Oncology and Overcoming the Barriers. This webinar forms part of the Rural Health West 2020 virtual conference. Before I hand you over to your presenter, I'd like to run through some brief housekeeping with you. If your audio is not coming through too clearly, you may prefer to switch to audio via your phone. These numbers will be listed on your dashboard and remember to enter in your pin number two. Everybody has been placed on mute so as to minimize background noise, but we would still love to hear from you. So if you do have any questions, enter them into the question box, which you should also be able to see on your dashboard. The presenter may choose to answer these questions straight away or save them for the end of the session. This session will be recorded and uploaded to the Rural Health West website under the virtual conference banner. I'll now hand you over to your presenter, Dr. Wei Hsien Lam. Uh, we're in Western Australia and I acknowledge the wisdom of uh, Aboriginal elders, both um, past, present and pay respect to the Aboriginal communities of today. So what I want to talk about today is just to give people a background of our cancer services currently in region remote Western Australia. Uh, I want to talk about our uh, barriers and issues to regional cancer care and the work that the WA Country Health Service is doing in developing new services, um, mainly our uh, flagship service, the telechemotherapy service, but some of the new projects that we're undertaking, which is the telelymphedema and teletrials. So just to give a background, we are the second largest administrative territory in the world uh, behind um, a, a um, territory um, in Russia. Um, and just to give a bit of context um, in terms of flight time, um, Broome is two and a half hours away uh, from, uh, from Perth by flight, um, but that's only one hub. Uh, obviously to get to Broome, there requires a lot of buses and traveling. And so although we talk about the travel time from two and a half hours for many of our regional patients, as you know, uh, travel time can be quite substantially more, sometimes even a day or two. So uh, for many patients in remote areas, there certainly are disadvantages in terms of geography. In terms of cancer care in um, Western Australia, um, the statistics are not great for our Indigenous patients. Um, Aboriginal women are 1.6 more times likely and Aboriginal men 1.4 more times likely to die from cancer. The most common cause of death of cancer in, is lung in males and the second most in women and breast cancer is, um, is the most common in women. Regional remote areas unfortunately have the highest cancer death rates um, and this is data from a decade ago that shows um, there's substantially more deaths in regional areas compared to our metro counterparts and I suspect that gap's probably widening. Um, there are many reasons for the uh, remoteness is uh, one reason uh, but many of uh, WA country health regions uh, service low socioeconomic populations um, and we know low socioeconomic um, uh, status is a risk factor for not just uh, poor cancer outcomes, but general health outcomes. So this is a diagram from the WA Country Health Service Cancer Plan, which in blue outlines what cancer services we have um, and uh, what cancer services we don't have. And some of the key areas is particularly in the Kimberley and Pilbara region where the only cancer service that is available um, is a regional cancer nurse coordinator, and this was in 2017 slash 2018. Um, so there are some areas uh, such as the Southwest is a reasonably well serviced by with uh, oncologists, and Southwest is the only service that has a radiation oncology bunker. Um, uh, but there are other regions, as I mentioned before, Kimberley and Pilbara region that are poorly serviced with, uh, with uh, no cancer service, and this was in 2000, uh, prior to 2018 or uh, 19. So, what are the barriers to good cancer outcomes? Um, we know that if you present earlier to a doctor with a symptom of a cancer, uh, then it is more likely that um, uh, you go through the pathway of diagnosing the cancer and straight to a treatment pathway. So for instance, if, um, if someone had a breast cancer mass, um, the earlier you detect it, the earlier you get to surgery, but the later you present it, then the risk is that that cancer in the breast can go to other parts of the body. 
and you may change a, a patient's pathway from a curative intent pathway to a um, what we call a palliative care pathway. Timely diagnosis is also particularly important uh, for our patients. So not only is it um, presenting to your GP or to a health service provider uh, to confirm that um, you need further investigations, but it is time to access the treatment. And particularly for our regional patients, where some of the investigations require you come to metro areas, that is certainly a barrier uh, to getting a timely diagnosis. Again, for example, say if you've got a, a mass, you present to your GP with a cough, your GP does an X-ray and it shows a lung mass. Then the next step is to do a CT scan and a biopsy of the lung mass. Now for most uh, regional and remote areas, um, having a CT scan means you have to travel to either a main regional area or to the metropolitan area. And to do a biopsy for the most majority of patients will have to come to the metropolitan area. The key other aspect is access to treatment. Many of our cancer treatments require surgery. Um, this is common in the metro areas. Uh, some regional areas can offer cancer surgery, um, but other treatments, uh, which is my role, is systemic treatment. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are some areas like the Southwest, the Great Summit area, uh, Midwest, uh, the Gulfers that have uh, uh, cancer centres that can provide systemic treatment. But as I mentioned before, prior to 2019, there were no areas in the Kimberley and Pilbara region that could provide systemic treatment. Uh, this is an article from uh, uh, BMJ which outlines some of the factors um, in terms of delays of diagnosis of cancer among Aboriginal people in Australia. And I highlighted a couple of things already. So the socioeconomic um, status of a patient um, is particularly important. Um, in this journal article, they, just, um, they use a, a case study of a patient who um, had a breast mass that was um, growing more substantially, but her priority was to provide for her family, and that's including meals. Um, and and with that, she delayed the, her diagnosis or her um, presentation to a health provider. And so, so therefore, that is a perfect example of where socioeconomic status um, influences a patient's decisions in terms of approaching a health service provider for treatment. There are historic uh, con uh, factors for Indigenous patients, and uh, particularly the impact of colonisation, um, and unfortunately racism is still prevalent in our communities, and this certainly uh, impacts um, Indigenous and Aboriginal patients uh, um, uh, seeking health care. We know with our remote regional um, areas that um, we do have self-system um, related factors that affect timely care. Um, access to medical services um, is reduced in our region areas, and this again is not just for cancer care, but for all medical services. Uh, we do not have the same availability of doctors in the metro areas compared to the regional areas. Um, lack of culturally safe environment. Um, sorry, there's a typo there, but a shortage of Aboriginal health professionals. Um, and retention of health professionals is particularly important in our regional areas. And as many of you know, we do have a transient workforce in our regional areas. Uh, some patients assess their symptoms um, and may dismiss their symptoms. Um, so for instance, someone that may have a cough may not seek medical attention, even though they may, may be brewing a lung cancer, uh, simply because either um, they are uh, they have other priorities in on mine, or um, um, again, for socioeconomic reasons, they may have other priorities and may not seek medical attention until unfortunately uh, the symptoms get worse. There are cultural factors in terms of um, patients presenting to health service providers. So for someone who um, may have a symptom, um, there may be a bit of a fear in presenting to a health um, service provider, they may, may be in denial that there may be something going wrong. Uh, uh, some people in the community may feel uh, shameful in presenting to the health provider with a health issue. In terms of the psychological trauma that patients may, Indigenous patients may have, um, I guess it's that future thought of if I had a problem, um, say if I had cancer, um, what would be the outcomes of that? Would that mean that I have to be away from family to receive treatment? 
um, do I want to know what's going on? Um, uh, um, and that's where I guess the denial part comes in. So the possibility of, I guess, a bad health outcome certainly affects our patients and certainly can cause that, I guess, cycle of trauma, trauma even before a cancer diagnosis occurs. One of the keys to improving regional cancer care, and as I've alluded to in those barriers and factors, earlier diagnosis um, is key to um, patients going to the um, pathway of potentially curative intent treatment. It is key that we um, that patients are linked to a cancer service service very quickly, um, and it's important that our GPs and other primary care sector um, uh, clinicians feel comfortable that they can refer to a cancer service very quickly and have a good relationship to uh, cancer services. It is really important to continue on with education of cancer awareness and continue of health promotion. That also includes smoking sensation, um, uh, reduction in alcohol intake, uh, good diet and good exercise. The, w, um, the Cancer Council have done a lot of work in this space in terms of health promotion. And in terms of care, care cancer awareness, um, there is um, a lot of work in terms of finding cancer early um, educational sessions that are run by the Cancer Council. What we've been doing, and this is, I guess, the theme of this presentation, is adopting alternative innovative models of cancer care. And in particular, and this is the theme of this talk, is to improve telehealth services, to improve access to cancer care from metro areas to regional areas. So, what is the plan? And so, there are a couple of statewide cancer plans that really helped us leverage what we've been doing at the moment. So the Sustainable Health Review came out last year and one of the key points from the Sustainable Health Review is that we need to improve equality in our in country health. We need to improve partnerships and average health outcomes. We need to improve uh, the culture, um, but particularly um, there was identification that we need to use the right technology um, and data to help support clinicians and drive change. And with this technology, this will help build financial sustainability, improve governance and systems. So the WA Cancer Plan um, was endorsed and released in 2017. And one of the key um, aspects of the WA Cancer Plan is to, um, to deliver the right care at the right place close to home. And as I mentioned before, we know that dying from cancer is great in rural and remote areas, and this is related to, again, prevention timely diagnosis, service access, and support to treatment. Um, so what we need to do is, and this is in one of the key directions of um, the cancer plan, is to have um, provide um, better treatment uh, for country patients, but improve their journey through cancer care. Cancer care can be very complex. It, as I alluded to, once you have a symptom of a cancer, it requires um, referrals to have further imaging, a repeat biopsy or range of diagnosis from there needs to be discussed at a multidisciplinary team meeting. And then referrals can be sent to either surgery, medical oncology, radiation oncology, palliative care, um, cancer nurse coordinators. So care can be very complex. So we need robust governance of cancer care, but we need to support our patients through treatment. And so through this, ways to provide better treatments through telehealth, uh, provide innovative deliveries of cancer services in our region, particularly in the Kimberley and Pilbara region. So to really drive the service, we need to understand what are the problems to our service. And so we need to understand why, um, what are the barriers to telehealth and um, as a health professional um, who commenced uh, this project in 2017, there were certainly many challenges with health professionals um, engaging with telehealth. So many of us were trained in a way of um, providing face-to-face -face, um, appointments via face-to-face. Um, -face. Um, many of clinicians that use the service have a lack of trust in technologies. Um, Many clinicians found that telehealth was time consuming and were very reluctant to use telehealth. Um, many clinicians had a lack of IT skills um, and there weren't much incentive to use telehealth 
And because uh, clinicians perceive telehealth as um, having difficulty in uh, using IT, um, and it was consuming, they just didn't feel that it was worthwhile for them to continue on the service. Uh, technology um, um, has been an issue and continues to be an issue, but certainly improving. So it's important to have the right equipment, the right video conferencing platform, access to internet, but it does require a lot of work in terms of having staff support telehealth. So um, I embarked on this journey with various people, but um, in the picture on the left of the screen is uh, Mel Pola, who was the project manager for uh, teleoncology. And part of our work, as mentioned in the barriers, is to really uh, create a, um, 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 the infrastructure for building telehealth. So there was a development of a working party to engaging stakeholders to, uh, in, to look at the barriers to telehealth and find ways to overcome those um, uh, issues and the procurement of equipment. So understanding what was lacking in um, some of our health service providers, providing that equipment, uh, both in the metro area and regional area, but also understanding what are the issues with using the equipment. Is it the microphone not working? Is the video uh, link poor? Is it is a problem with a platform? So her work um, was instrumental in really building the infrastructure uh, for telehealth. My role was the clinical engagement, as I mentioned before, um, health professionals, um, many were very reluctant to use telehealth. And so my role was to try and educate staff, support staff in, in using telehealth. And in a period of uh, just under uh, two years, we certainly saw an increase of using teleoncology. You can see there, there was an 84% increase in um, teleoncology service events from 2016-17 to 2018-2019. So what have we achieved so far? And for those who know me, I'm an adamant, uh, avid, uh, sorry, Fremantle doctor supporter, and I thought we got robbed um, by not having a free grand, uh, women's grand final. Um, but they certainly achieved by being top of ladder and almost on the cusp of winning our first premiership. So our telechemotherapy service is certainly our, our flagship service. And this is based on the Queensland model, which was commenced uh, in 2007. Um, and this involves having a metro medical oncologist providing supervision of a service via telehealth to a regional area. We have senior chemotherapy nurses that are trained in the regional areas. So their um, education is upskilled fairly quickly. And you can see in the picture that was Chris Henneker, who's instrumental in helping provide that senior chemotherapy support and training. Um, Recently, we had a senior oncology pharmacist that helps provide that support for delivery of treatment um, and administration of chemotherapy by local upskilled nursing staff. The key requirements to have a telechemotherapy services outlined there. So these are the 10 key requirements as outlined from uh, the QREX model, which is the Queensland uh, chemotherapy service model. So you must have good strategy and governance financial considerations, you must have the workforce to support the service, you must have a systemic therapeutic management, uh, management program, um, you must be telehealth enabled and uh, utilise uh, digital health, um, you must have a mechanism for removing hazardous chemicals, um, the key thing for our chemo nurses is education and training, but you must also have the correct documentation and a, a good follow-up plan. This is Professor Sabe Sabza, who's the godfather of telechemotherapy service in our region areas. And you can see there, um, uh, he is doing a conference call to someone in a region area. You can see someone is Gupton Glounder, which is the chemotherapy nurse, and a the patient there participating in the consult. We have a senior chemotherapy nurse also in the metro area that's providing support and supervision to the regional cancer nurse, uh, chemo nurse. So, what is the literature to, um, to help support um, the service? So as I mentioned before, um, the barriers to the services, uh, do clinicians find this worthwhile or is it a big issue to use telehealth? But for regional patients, do they find video conferencing comfortable? Um, do they, can they build rapport with patients? 
And so through this publication or this study, uh, this qualitative study, um, these are some of the commentary that was from some of the patients. Um, one, consultation, so consultation looked smooth and spontaneous. Rapport and relationships are easily established. So one of the commentaries from many, page, uh, many clinicians um, who were using telehealth is that they, couldn't, they felt that they couldn't build rapport by video conferencing, they had to see the patients face to face. But the evidence suggests that patients actually find rapport much e um, as easy via video conferencing. The other added benefit of telehealth is that patients who are in their own environment um, are commonly accompanied, and this is one of the main things about WA Health Service, that they're commonly present with local health workers. Um, so we have a chemo nurse or a cancer nurse sitting in the other end who helps support and, and sometimes even translates what I have to say. I may say in medical terms and sometimes having a cancer nurse in the other end to speak in layman's terms is particularly helpful for our uh, regional patients. But sometimes we have family members who are available via telehealth and that creates a, um, a more relaxed environment for our patients. We do accept there are potential problems um, with this service. Um, as I mentioned before, it really heavily requires some coordination of care, particularly for our telehealth um, our service providers. Some patients are hard of hearing, um, but so it's particularly important to have a healthcare worker present in the uh, meeting. Um, doctors, um, sometimes have difficulty using telehealth, they're not comfortable with service. And yes, from time to time, we do have technical difficulties with using telehealth. One of the key things, again, this is a journal article from Professor Sabe Sarbison in terms of telecology models, is technical difficulties. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, telecology uh, models, uh, is it a merely about avoiding long distances of travel? Um, and as a, this is another um, uh, journal article supporting uh, the fact that um, both patients and clinicians um, find that uh, models are, uh, this model of care um, works well. Uh, one of the key aspects of um, this model of care that wasn't addressed in the other article was that one of, um, one of the things is that it improved waiting times for patients. So as I mentioned before, uh, patients um, had um, um, had certainly delays in treatment uh, because of trying to get to the metropolitan areas um, and so these models of telechemo care improve wait times but they certainly also improve the capability of regional services so um, regional staff were upskilled in cancer care um, and delivery of treatment but they also understood cancer care better so um, patients had better um, outcomes purely by improved support from the regional centres, but also um, nursing staff and um, uh, medical staff had um, uh, had upskilled um, and enjoyed their work better because they understood um, the work better, the cancer care better. One of the common co um, uh, comments from uh, our oncologists is is it safe to provide chemotherapy in rural towns? Uh, so one of the big aspects with um, cancer treatment is toxicity of treatment. Certainly some of our chemo agents can cause um, febrile nitrogen, or that's infection related to um, a reduced immune system. Um, there are certainly many other toxins that can occur uh, with chemotherapy. And so this study showed that there was actually no significant difference in terms of how much treatment you get. So some patients we have to reduce treatment because the um, the treatment is too toxic. Um, but this study shows that compared to Mount Isa, which is um, a, a remote area compared to Townsville, that there was no reduction in the amount of treatment cycles due to toxicity. Um, that you didn't have to reduce uh, doses significantly between metro and regional areas. Um, the side effect profile between metro patients and regional patients were similar. And the amount of hospital admissions required because of a toxic treatment was actually very similar between both a main cancer centre and a telechemotherapy service. One of the key aspects, which I know administrators love to hear, are the cost savings from, um, uh, from a, a new service delivery model. And again, this is a, a, a study from Queensland looking at 2007 to 2011 when they started telechemotherapy chemotherapy service. 
And the cost savings um, involved with, um, uh, with the telechemotherapy service, and you can see there, the cost saving was just under, um, or sorry, just over $300,000. If you imagine that's um, in the space of uh, five years between 2007 and 2011, um, in Western Australia, where we have large distances, um, I suspect that cost savings will be dramatic. And this was 2007, so there certainly there would be inflation. So the cost savings for our health service would be dramatic through the telechemotherapy services. The other um, cost, which is probably not captured, is this is the cost of the patient. So many of our patients, um, although they're um, subsidised by PATS, um, often, if they're in the metro area, they have to pay for um, their food. Their accommodation may only be partially subsidised. Um, whereas, and loss of work as well. So many of our patients may be working in a remote or regional areas, but when they come to metro areas for cancer treatment, they're away from work, which means they're not um, obtaining income. So there's a cost savings to the patient, not just the health service, uh, if we treat patients close to the home. Again, this is just another um, table outlining the cost savings made from, uh, from uh, having a telechemotherapy service. The telechemotherapy service has um, attracted um, a lot of publicity, uh, particularly uh, in Queensland. You can see a few ABC articles there. Um, uh, um, you can see the comments um, in the in the last um, uh, print, the specialists in towns will get a conference in and the patient can be sitting here in their hometown receiving the treatment they would usually receive in a tertiary hospital. Uh, uh, there's one comment here, I drive myself to the hospital and I drive myself home. I go back to the shop after chemo and I'm not feeling terrible. Um, these same patients, um, uh, if um, in WA, would fly, you know, two to three hours to receive their cancer uh, to see their specialist, receive their chemo, and then have to fly back. And, you know, that vast distance feeling unwell is not pleasant. Uh, this is the um, New South Wales telechemo service. So that commenced about two, three years ago. And this is the first patient that received um, um, chemotherapy through the regional telechemotherapy service. And you can see the cancer patient, Stephen Mills, estimates he's avoided driving 4,500 kilometres since November by receiving um, treatment via telehealth. And he also mentioned that um, uh, that he himself, and he heard of, he has heard of other patients that would have stopped treatment um, if they um, uh, if they didn't have to if they travelled long distances. And um, and many of our regional patients would have been in that scenario where they just couldn't travel any further. Uh, for their cancer treatment, and that was certainly infected, ca affected cancer outcomes. Um, last year, we launched our new telechemotherapy service in Carafa. Um, you can see this awful picture of myself on a telephone uh, uh, on a screen, um, but this is a very this is our flagship service in Carafa, and I'm very proud that it's been running for a good uh, seven eight months now and running very well. Uh, particularly in this COVID environment where patients were unable to travel to the metro areas um, and were lucky, fortunate enough to receive this treatment in our uh, in Caratha. So uh, I actually want to thank all the good staff in Caratha Health Campus, um, particularly Bridie and Tracy, who are very passionate about the service. And a really encouraging thing for myself is to really see the growth that that service has um, has provided, particularly in Bright and Tracy, who have learned a lot along the way, um, and are really strong advocates uh, advocates for their cancer patients. So, um, and this is the point that I want to bring that bring a service to rare areas upskills our cancer pay, um, cancer nursing staff and other staff, um, and I and I feel that. Um, um, job satisfaction um, is very high. Patients really um, are very happy that they ha don't have to travel um, um, to uh, vast distances. And I think um, our nurses enjoy being able to provide that service. So it is very exciting to provide these chemotherapy services to our regional patients. Most recently, a couple of weeks ago, we launched our Naranja and Broom service. Uh, this is our two staff 
uh, Jasmine and Monique, who are actually two chemotherapy nurses that actually formerly worked in uh, chemotherapy centres. So um, uh, Jasmine is from uh, Sir Charles Gunner Hospital and Monique's from Peter Mac in Victoria. Uh, so very experienced there. So Bream are very fortunate to have two very uh, trained uh, two trained telechemo nurses. Um, so this again is very exciting and saves many of our regional patients from travelling to the metro area. Similarly, the narrative service, um, that is very exciting. Um, and again, um, lots of publicity of the Narragin service, um, especially with their new uh, centre. Um, and they'll, um, I think there'll be a lot of demand for the Narragin uh, telechemotherapy service. So again, very exciting times for all these regional centres. And I hope the telechemotherapy service grows to many regional areas. One of the other aspects is in our cancer plan is what other extra services can we provide for our regional patients? And one of the dilemmas with telehealth is, um, is you can't examine the patient or you can't touch your patient. And for many of our allied health services that requires um, physical contact with patients, the interface with telehealth can be challenging. So this is a very exciting service, which is a partnership between WA Country Health and Fiona Stanley Hospital to provide telemedicine service to our regional patients. And um, this is, um, you can see there, there's Sarah Ang, who's the real driver of um, the service at Fiona Stanley Hospital. So she's a trained physiotherapist in lymphedema. And she has been the driving force for this telelymphedema uh, tele service. So what this involves is um, having a specialist telelymphedema service um, in the metro site, telehealthing into a regional site, but having general physio occupational therapists in a regional area. What is involved is, of course, telelymphedema is a very specialised allied health service. It requires physical examination of uh, swelling of an arm or, uh, or swelling of a limb, um, um, discussion about garment um, fittings um, and, and massaging. And that's re that requires that physical contact. But what um, Sarah and her team have done is upskilled our regional services to learn how to do these assessments, but have supervision through um, a specialised um, allied health staff in a metro area. Um, they've, um, they continue to do well with the service and there is scope for expansion of this service to other regional areas. So we're very excited to see um, the service grow to hopefully more regional sites. But we hope that the service is the um, benchmark for other allied health services to use where, uh, again, you'd have a specialised um, allied health uh, physician in a metro site. You would have a general allied health staff in the region area, which we would upskill. And having that metro supervision to help provide support and education to our regional allied health staff. So I do see this service being a pilot project for all our allied health services moving forward. So I'm very excited about this project. And I think this is going to um, really change how we manage our regional patients. The last project, which is our newest project, is teletrials. Um, and what I describe to patients with, um, with trials is that clinical trials allow patients treatments, um, uh, new and cutting edge treatments that you would normally not get for another three to five years. From a, from a medical oncologist's point of view, the biggest thing that's changed in the last decade is immunotherapy. So I'm going to use the example of melanoma. And melanoma, namely metastatic melanoma, which is melanoma that spreads other parts of the body, uh, unfortunately um, was a poor prognosis cancer. We used to give chemotherapy. Uh, and most people would only live six to 12 months with metastatic melanoma. And then this new treatment came out with immunotherapy and one of those, I guess, recipients was Jared Ruffett, who's the captain of um, the Hawthorne Football Club many years ago. He had melanoma lip that went into the lungs. He went on clinical trial of immunotherapy. Um, the cancer completely disappeared and he came back, um, back, uh, came back to playing football. So that is a remarkable uh, aspect of cancer care that we would rarely see in the chemotherapy era. Now, if you imagine um, that with a trial, um, by the time you have all the results, um, it takes about anything from three, uh, one to three years, 
and then you have to have uh, government approval to subsidise the drug, which could take another year or two. So the turnaround time from when the clinical trial starts to actually the trial being a uh, drug being on market can take anything from three to five years. Particularly for our regional patients, one of the challenges with our regional patients is uh, trials are often provided in um, the Kansas, uh, in the metropolitan areas. So patients would own, would have to come to Metro South to receive these treatments. And as I alluded to in the previous slide, many patients do not want to travel all the way um, for a treatment. And particularly, I guess, for an experimental drug, some patients will go, look, I don't want to be receiving experimental treatment. I don't know, that's where I'd rather spend time closer to the home. So the teletrial model is a model that's developed um, nationwide by the Clinical Quality Society of Australia to try and bridge the gap and bring tele uh, clinical trials to regional patients, to bring cutting edge treatment um, sooner rather than later. And again, leans on the telechemo model, where you have a primary site where you have specialist people, um, including clinical trial coordinators, specialist pharmacists, for telehealth into the satellite site. We commenced the pilot project last year, and in the uh, screen there is uh, Ling Lau, who is um, um, our project manager for teletrials. And so the key thing is to build the infrastructure for teletrials, engage with our stakeholders, and try and find clinical trials that are suitable um, uh, for the, uh, the teletrial um, project. Um, some of the key aspects is to, again, partner with um, our tertiary sites. So we have a great partnership with Fiona Stanley Hospital to develop teletrials. And there's some eagerness from Fiona Stanley Hospital to pilot the teletrial project. Unfortunately, with the COVID situation, many clinical trials internationally and nationally has been put on hold, um, but we hope to restart this project um, in the near future. So in closing, what I want to say is that um, we acknowledge that outcomes are poorer in regional and remote areas, not just in cancer care, but in all areas of, of, of health. Um, what we have learned over the last three, four years, that if you engage with your stakeholders, really promote services, um, be advocates for our patients, that you can improve your services. We've also shown through uh, evidence, particularly from Queensland, that the evidence shows that clinical outcomes are similar between metro and regional areas if you provide a telechemotherapy service. And particularly for uh, patients who, um, who did not have access to cancer care uh, because of vast instances, now they have access to cancer care. And what we hope in the future is that we uh, increase the number of telechemotherapy services in our regional and remote areas, we improve uh, cancer coordination and nurse um, and nursing in our regional remote areas and provide improved allied health services and Aboriginal healthcare workers in our um, in our remote and regional areas, particularly in cancer care. Thank you very much for um, allowing me to speak and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lan. It's Beth here. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the question box um, to see if any have come through. Um, we do still have a few uh, participants online. Um, there has uh, there is a question that's just come through. Do you see that, or would you like me to read it to you? One of our participants asks, um, she says, we are currently finding that our regional clinics have had to be reduced in numbers due to telehealth. How can we deal with this? Sorry, I just realised my audio was on mute. Was there any questions at all? Yes, there is one question that's come through. Um, if, I'll just read them to you, Dr. Lamb. Um, we've had one question that says, we are currently finding that our regional clinics have had to be reduced in numbers due to telehealth. How can we deal with this? 
and also from the same participant, we have found the support from telehealth services to be limited. This is taking nurses off the floor. How is WAX to deal with this? Okay, so the first question about um, telehealth services, and um, I guess um, the COVID virus really changed um, the way we do things, and we do acknowledge that um, we've had to do things very quickly um, because of the COVID situation. So normally with any new service, um, there would be a lot of planning and thought um, put in to, um, to have a service um, well supported, uh, a plan in place um, and a process in place that everyone understands. And we know with any new service, there's always gonna be teething issues. And certainly with, um, with the uptake of, um, of telehealth services in our region, it's particularly because of uh, clinicians not being able to travel, um, this was a particular problem. And this is, is an ongoing issue for our new uh, telehealth services. I guess one of the aspects of um, uh, providing a telehealth service is experience. Um, so for many of our clinicians and our staff in our regional areas who may not be familiar with uh, telehealth, it is a bit of an understanding of the capabilities of telehealth um, and an understanding of what you can and can't do. And with anything, uh, it does take time to understand a service. So I guess the first comment is um, experience. So I've been um, an oncologist since 2017, a consultant oncologist since 2017, and been running the SPEN service, telehealth service since 2017. And I do acknowledge when I first um, started the service, um, I had to learn um, the processes. It did take me a, um, a lot longer in terms of having that consultation, learning um, the ins and outs of the patient, learning um, the workflows. But certainly that has improved over time. Um, I've been able to form a relationship with um, my chemo nurses and aspirants um, and ha have um, developed workflow. So the first thing I think we, sh we shouldn't underestimate is experience and I guess not to be too hard on ourselves. Um, we, I guess we are high achieving um, uh, uh, clinical staff. We do want to do what's best for our patients and yes, um, it is very challenging for um, um, when you're starting a new service to be efficient, particularly when you've been running a service face-to-face -face for many years and you understand the workflows. So I think that's one comment is that over time, um, experience is, is, is important and efficiency does improve uh, with experience. Um, yes, we are limited with the technologies that we have. Um, so uh, we do use the basic services of emailing, um, faxing, um, and ideally long term we would like to have an a oncology um, management system that helps bridge that gap. So one of the aspects I guess from WA Country Health is to develop an oncology management system for prescribing and for documentation and that would help, certainly help um, long term in terms of the efficiencies um, of arranging treatment, uh, reducing uh, risk, um, and duplication of work. So they're more the long-term aspirations of the service. In terms of, I guess, the question of how do we improve the service short-term, as I mean for one is experience, two is understanding the issue. So some of the commentary that's come back is particularly last month because of COVID is that understanding of who does what, um, uh, who should be scanning, do we get things in a timely fashion, um, and those aspects, I think, from the conversations I've had with um, staff, um, hopefully there's some, uh, I guess, agreement about in terms of the processes. And I guess over the coming month, hopefully there's a greater understanding. Um, clinicians, um, I think, in some areas have had to push back to 30 minute points when they have normally had 20 minute appointments. And I can understand uh, in that respect um, because um, they are still understanding service. The feedback from some of those clinicians who have had 30 minute points are saying that um, they're finding that that's too long now because they're understanding the service. And so um, certainly there, sh um, there could be discussions about um, reducing those points from 30 minutes to 20 minutes to get through more patients. Uh, doing things um, on the go, so as you would normally do, 
um, in a consult. So for instance, in my experience service, um, I'm trying to dictate letter at this um, after consult and write the chart straight after. Um, some of our clinicians have been doing it at the very end and that may work for them. Um, but if they're used to the process of um, doing the charts, um, uh, dictating letter per patient um, at, um, straight after patient, um, then they should follow that same process for the telehealth service. And I find that process much more efficient than doing it at the very end because then you have to go back to the notes and go through your notes again to try and write a letter or do a chart. I do accept that um, the process is cumbersome at the moment. Um, and yes, we do need to work through the issues. And yes, I've had numerous conversations and I think there will still be issues. Uh, but I suspect these issues will um, uh, will improve over time and certainly, yes, please ask any concerns or issues. Uh, there was a question too, which I can't quite remember. Um, what was that again, Beth? Well, that's dropped out of my screen now too, Dr. Lamb, but I think that you covered that response. That's great, thank you. Um, any Hi. other questions? Yeah, I can't see anything else coming through at this point in time. Um, so I think we will sign off now. So thank you for those who joined us on the webinar this afternoon. We hope that you enjoyed the session. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Lamb for his time and for being part of the Rural Health West Virtual Conference. And um, just to remind everybody that um, we have recorded this webinar this afternoon. Um, and we will make it available on the Rural Health West website under the virtual conference banner. Um, if there are any other questions coming through, I, I apologise that we might not be able to get to everything this afternoon. Um, we do have to sign off um, and ready ourselves for another recording. Um, but I'm sure that um, Dr. Lamb will be happy for people to um, direct any questions straight through to him. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and I'll close the webinar now. Thank you again for your time. Bye.